This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices, episode 214, was recorded on April 9th, 2020. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode of Macro Voices is dedicated to healthcare workers all over the world who, without a doubt, are the true heroes of the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. This episode of Macro Voices is brought to you by TopTradersUnplugged.com, a podcast dedicated to quant and rules-based investing, helping investors overcome behavioral biases. One River Asset Management CIO Eric Peters returns as this week's feature interview guest. We'll discuss the recent performance of the long volatility strategy and trend following as risk hedges and how well they've worked in protecting portfolios during the present crisis. We'll also discuss the arguments for a return to secular inflation and what that means for markets and investors. And be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment, when we're going to go into more detail on crude oil storage, can tango in the crude oil term structure, and how those two things are related, and where the trading opportunities lie for both futures and equity investors as we navigate these difficult times when storage is at an extreme premium. And just a quick reminder for any listeners who are not checking the website regularly, we have produced three special episodes of Macro Voices earlier this week with feature-length interviews. The first was a crude oil special featuring petroleum geologist Art Berman and Professor Nate Hagens, which we published on Monday morning. The next was a brilliant appearance by Dr. Pippa Melmgren on Tuesday. Then on Wednesday, CPM Group founder Jeffrey Christian debunked some of the common myths and misconceptions about the physical precious metals markets. All of those interviews can be found free of charge on our homepage at macrovoices.com, and our thanks go out to the listeners whose donations made this extra content possible. And I'm Patrick Ceresna. Now, listeners, you'll, we'll have a detailed update of the COVID-19 coronavirus crisis in our post-game segment after the feature interview. Now, Eric, let's jump right into the S&P 500. Here we are, 2,800. We've got uh, Powell basically announcing a big stimulus, and that uh, drove the S&P right up to the 50% retracement. What's your take on all of this? Well, fortunately for me, I covered my S&P shorts at the Futures Open on Sunday evening. Uh, I didn't know what Powell was going to do next. The reason that I had a change of heart is that I've kind of changed my mental model for how I think this coronavirus crisis is going to unfold in terms of stock market psychology. Originally, I thought, okay, people are not going to understand exponential growth. They're going to see things getting much worse very quickly. Just as we approach the peak of infections, that's going to create the greatest amount of fear and panic. That's where the market lows are going to come in. And that would suggest the market lows happening maybe into the beginning of next week sometime. We're seeing the opposite. Why is that? I think the reason is that one of the very few things the Trump administration is doing quite well is their messaging. They're telling everybody, look, everybody, this is the week from hell. It's this week and next week. That's going to be the worst of it until we get to that point of peak infections. And because of that messaging, I think that the market is discounting that ahead of time, saying, okay, the light's there at the end of the tunnel. It's going to be really, really bad for the next week or two. But then they're saying it's going to get better. Time to start buying stocks. Now, I think that's faulty logic because, frankly, we don't know for sure that we're going to hit peak infections. That's based on other countries that, frankly, have done a better job at implementing non-pharmaceutical interventions, or NPIs, which is the social distancing and various other measures which are used to contain the crisis outbreak. So I think it's quite possible that things are worse than they appear. And so maybe it's not really going to be all better after all. And frankly, peak infections is not 
peak crisis. It is true from a uh, equipment management standpoint. If you had enough ventilators to get through peak infections, then you probably got enough for the rest of the crisis. So from a logistics standpoint and overwhelming the hospital system, it's very important. But the economy still has to stay shut down until we contain these infections and we get to no new infections or almost no new infections. So this is not over yet. And I think that what is likely to happen, Patrick, is probably sometime next week, week. If the analysts' expectations are fulfilled, what we'll see is a peaking and a gradual reduction in the daily number of U.S. cases of COVID-19 that have been detected and diagnosed. That is going to cause the market to rally very sharply. I think we'll see an acceleration of the rally that we've already seen as everybody says, okay, that's it. We're past peak infections. This thing is finally ending. That will be the sell the news moment, in my opinion. And I wouldn't be surprised if we get a blow off top there. The uh, 61.8 Fibonacci retracement of the move down is 2930. If you're all the way past 2900, hey, you know, round number is kind of appealing there at 3000. I wouldn't be surprised if we got back to 3000 on that blow off. But uh, I don't think this is anything close to the end. As we'll discuss later uh, in the postgame segment, we'll go into detail about the COVID crisis. But uh, it's not ending just because the peak of the first wave of infections has been reached. So from an economic standpoint, this is nowhere close to over. But I think the stock market's going to be celebrating as if it were over when we get to that peak infection moment. And I think that's your sell the news opportunity. Right. Well, you know, for me, at least on the S&P 500, we've uh, started to already put on some option positions for the turn. But because of the strategies we use, we we have a little more forgiveness about not having to be perfect with our timing. But it certainly is a very interesting level on the markets right now. Let's move on to that U.S. dollar. And uh, obviously, not a positive reaction on uh, Powell's announcement. What's your take on the dollar here? Well, Patrick, until the last couple of days, it looked to me like the the rally was in healthy shape. Now, kind of rolling over here, I think, as you say, maybe it's a reaction to Powell. We'd really have to get below that prior low to establish an ongoing trend of lower highs and lower lows. Uh, I don't really see that happening. I think that the general narrative here is you have some Fed accommodation whether it was the big monetary intervention or you have a a fiscal stimulus bill that's passed by the Congress. And everybody says, oh my gosh, they're going to print so much money to pay for all this. It's got to be bad for the dollar and the dollar knee jerks down. And then the market kind of shakes that off and realizes, hey, wait a minute, everything going on in the world is really pretty darn dollar positive. And you see that recovery. So the way I interpret this chart, Patrick, is we had the the big pullback after the unlimited monetary intervention. And now it looks like we're getting a little pullback from additional accommodation. So I think the pattern is there is an uptrend, but it gets interrupted every time there's more accommodation. Maybe there's going to be a lot more accommodation. It'll bat it down. I don't know. But uh, I don't think that the fundamentals for a stronger dollar have left the market yet. I think that the uh, argument is still there. And of course, the big test will be a test to 104. We're a long way from that. All right. Well, let's move on to crude oil now. We're going to have a continued conversation about this in the post game. But, uh, you, you know, my take on this is that, like, I think the expectation was simply built too high. And uh, it's like we're selling off on that OPEC news. How, how do you interpret all of this, Eric? Well, there's so much to unpack here, Patrick, and we will go into more detail in postgame. First of all, for anybody who doesn't know all about the OPEC meeting, we did a full hour-long podcast with Art Berman and Nate Hagens. That was published on Monday, and we talked about what we expected. Now that the big event has happened, I I see it very differently. And frankly, I I smell a rat here, Patrick. As much as the the OPEC people are frankly, uh, I think a lot more fluff than substance in in a lot of the things that they do. They're good at fluff. They know how to jawbone the market. They are very, very good at showing up 10 minutes before the pit close with some kind of headline that sounds good that, you know, their ministers are working toward a cut or whatever, and it ends up just banging the close higher. They're really good at playing that game. They know what they're doing. Today's big cut meeting was punctuated by all kinds of released, they they had presentations and so forth that were supposed to be for this meeting that were released through the media 
and the language in them talking about we have to do something. The fundamentals are horrific. We're going to face single digit oil prices if we don't act. The situation is that dire. Patrick, when have you ever heard OPEC publicly using messaging like that? It feels to me like maybe what's happening here is they had to go through the motions of this cut meeting because President Trump really leaned on them to do so. But it almost seems like they're kind of throwing the game here because at about 20 minutes before the the pit closed today, crude oil futures were plummeting, just dropping like a knife through melted butter straight down. OPEC is usually just so good at throwing in that headline that hits the tape just at about 20 minutes after two o'clock, 10 minutes before the close. There was actually a tweet that came out from one of the journalists saying, oh yeah, the, the OPEC ministers are taking a coffee break. They, they announced that 10 minutes before the close. I have never seen OPEC screw up their PR anywhere close to this badly. And it makes me think they're doing it on purpose. Now they have agreed supposedly to a 10 million barrel cut. Art Berman and Nate Hagens explained why this is basically irrelevant. Anas Alhaji had an article in Forbes today making the same argument that basically what's going on is people who are forced because of market conditions to cut back on their production because there's no place to put the oil. They don't have any tanks left to store the oil in. There's nobody to sell it to. What those people are doing is saying, okay, we know we have to cut production. There's no choice about it. Rather than do that and you know, make it look like the market forced us to do it. Let's have a meeting and let's announce with a lot of hype and hoopla, we're leading the charge toward market stability with a cut. And this cut is going to involve what? Basically, each one of the OPEC plus members committing to make a cut of production, which is probably smaller than what they're going to have to make because of market conditions. So it's meaningless. It doesn't have any effect. Normally, what I would expect and what we described in the podcast on Monday is I thought they were going to finesse the jawboning of this and tell everybody, you know, the biggest cut in history and, you know, OPEC is stabilizing the market, blah, blah, blah. Instead, they're talking about horrific fundamentals and single digit prices if we don't do something. And they're using that language publicly. So I think something is just very fishy about that. In any event, Patrick, uh, that's the OPEC story. It's just unwinding this afternoon. The other thing is there was no official briefing. So we only know kind of indirectly from journalists who were privy to what was going on in, in the meeting. There was no press conference and there's supposed to be G20 meetings tomorrow. They did say that the cut is not contingent on G20 cutting, they do expect at least 5 million barrels from the United States and other non-OPEC countries. And of course, one of the challenges there is the United States doesn't have any legal way to mandate that anyone cut oil, although it may be that the Texas Railroad Commission does have that authority, at least within their own state boundaries. Eric, how did the inventory numbers come in? Patrick, we saw a build of 15.2 million barrels. Now, that would normally be an epic, just holy cow, you know, biggest build in years. It was basically expected. Everybody knows that we've got at least 20 million barrels of demand destruction because of the global COVID-19 coronavirus crisis. So it really is not a big surprise. Cushing, Oklahoma, building 6.4 million barrels. Gasoline, building a massive 10.5 million barrels to Still, it's building a half a million barrels. So it's a build every place. And that's, you know, what, 26 million barrels between finished products and crude oil. So huge, huge, huge builds. The move down on prices in reaction to that was significant, but it was delayed. It wasn't the instantaneous move we usually see when the data comes out. What that implies to me is maybe the algorithms that uh, the computer trading algorithms that trade the headline releases have been turned off because the fundamentals are a little bit out of whack with usual. So they're letting the human traders trade with their own human discretion. That's all I can guess because there was a significant move down, but it Normally, it happens within milliseconds of the data coming out because the computers are reading the headline. Didn't happen this week. All right. Well, let's move on to gold. What's your take on uh, this breakout? Is it for real? Patrick, I think it is. And this is kind of a, a, a two-part answer from me. What I've described before, which is I think when the stock market really, really goes down a lot, it's going to drag gold down with it. 
I still think that. But the thing is, as I described earlier, I, I think the timetable for the stock market has changed. The stock market's direction is very clearly up. And we've just broken on gold today above a key technical level. You can make the argument that there was an inverse head and shoulders pattern that broke. Normally, head and shoulders is a reversal pattern. This really wasn't a reversal. So maybe you disqualify it. I, I don't know. But you know, it, it's looking really good. So I do think that the pullback that happens in gold will occur when the stock market sells off hard, which I do think is coming. But at this point, I think it's more likely that we break maybe back to fresh all-time highs. I believe the number in 2011 was 1,922. That head and shoulders, if you qualify it as a head and shoulders, targets about that number. So I think we might be heading up to around $1,900. And maybe what will happen is the big pullback that I've been talking about for weeks will happen after all, but it'll be a pullback from 1900 back down to 1700 and then we move up again from there. Uh, it certainly is not something that I'm planning to wait for anymore. I added to my own gold position at 1625 which was about a 50% retracement of that correction down where I saw that it looked like the head and shoulders pattern was likely to complete, so I was a little bit late to buy the right shoulder there. And uh, I think that we're we're going places. Now, as a technicality, we haven't really broken the neckline of the head and shoulders pattern. But as I said earlier, the head and shoulders is normally a reversal pattern, which is not the circumstance here. In general, it looks to me like everything just looks terrific. The fundamentals are incredible. I do think the stock market is going to put a dent on gold and pull it back at some point, but maybe not until we move considerably higher than we are from here. And finally, Patrick, I just want to mention we got a lot of feedback from about two or three weeks ago when I quickly breezed over some concepts about the physical market and how it works. We did a full podcast with Jeffrey Christian on Wednesday this week. where We talk all about physical delivery, the real reasons why there's a premium in the market for physical coins and uh, retail sized bars and so forth. So for anyone interested in that, be sure to check out the podcast with Jeff Christian on our homepage at macrovoices.com. So let's uh, let's talk 10 year Treasury yields here, Eric. I mean, they continue to be under quite a bit of pressure. We can't seem to muster up any meaningful bounce in them. And inflation expectations may continue to be quite pinned due to uh, the weak oil prices. So what's your take here? Are we going still lower on yields? You know, there's really no change to my view that I've expressed for the last couple of weeks, which is there is a good macro argument for higher bond prices. But the thing is, the U.S. Treasury is negotiating or it's close to negotiating the zero bound on the 10 year. We got down to what, 35 basis points or something at one point. Frankly, how relevant the zero bound is, is it just another number on the way to negative yields? Or is the zero boundary really a boundary that can't be negotiated without extraordinary circumstances? Frankly, I don't know. What's important in my mind is to ask all of our feature interview guests whether or not the scenario that I've feared for years, which is where bonds and stocks start selling off together, breaking their usual inverse correlation, is a risk. And so I'm going to continue to asking our guests that. Until then, I don't personally have a whole lot of strong conviction about the direction of Treasury yields. Well, this week's feature interview guest is One River Asset Management CIO, Eric Peters. Now, why did we invite Eric back as a, our guest this week? Well, Eric is a super guy. He's a very smart macro thinker. Uh, he's an out-of-the-box guy, so he's good for an unusual situation like this. But frankly, uh, his funds have been in the trade press quite a bit lately. You remember when we had Chris Cole on the program, and he told us about long volatility strategies as well as trend-following strategies as diversifications and hedges for risk in, in equity portfolios. Well, Eric Peters runs both a long vol fund and a trend following fund. Both of his funds are up on the gear. The vol fund is way up to the point where it's making headlines. So it just seemed like getting the guy who's been really acing the calls on the show was really relevant. The other thing is I know he's been watching inflation on the radar screen. The last couple of times that we've talked to him about it, he said, you know, I think we need to start thinking about inflation yet. It's not time, but I think it's coming. Well, I think we're a little closer and I'll ask him about that in this interview.
This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by TopTradersUnplugged.com. In recent weeks, we've been reminded of the fragility of world financial markets and how quickly sentiment can shift from risk on to risk off. Once again, the mantra of buy the dip and the determination of central banks will be put to the test. But as Chris Cole recently told us, the best approach to investing in the long run is very different from what's worked best in recent decades. To help Macro Voices listeners navigate an uncertain future, Niels Kastrup Larson, host of the Top Traders Unplugged podcast, has created a guide to the best investment books of all time. You can get a free copy at toptradersunplugged.com forward slash macro guide. And be sure to listen to my full length interview with Niels Kastrup Larson on trend following. The download link is in your research roundup email. Check out toptradersunplugged.com today. You'll be glad you did. Eric's interview with Eric Peters is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at macrovoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Eric Peters, founder of One River Asset Management. Eric, I, I guess, uh, obviously, the, the question that's on everybody's mind is this coronavirus crisis and how long it's going to last and so forth. Was the coronavirus the cause of this market dislocation, or is it more the case that the virus was the pin that popped a bubble that was already ready to pop? And uh, either way, how do you see this crisis unfolding from here? Hey, Eric. It's nice to be back. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me again. Always uh, always good, particularly in really interesting periods for uh, for markets like this. I mean, clearly this this virus is the catalyst for this move, and uh, I mean that's obvious. But in terms of the move itself, and you know, kind of the the market structure, I would say that we've been building into the market structure a lot of fragility over over many years that were. Well, largely speaking, just underappreciated. I, you know, I think that the people looked at at the 2008 crisis and just said that was caused by you know too much speculation, lots of securities that were tied to housing and over leverage, and you know the the, the banks were um, too aggressive in terms of all kinds of their activities, and and as a result, you know, once we once we fixed that, we got to the heart of of that crisis, given that. That it was really a financial crisis, albeit tied to housing. Once we got to the heart of that, then it'd be highly unlikely that we would have another crisis of, of a material magnitude. And so, just generally speaking, the, the combination of, of uh, CEOs believing that we would not have another great crisis again, we could have periods of, of economic slowdown, but you know, not a great crisis. And investors also agreeing that we would not have a great crisis again. You know, it got kind of everyone around the table to start engaging in activities that, in essence, levered corporate balance sheets and used investor capital and portfolios to to help corporations do that, and that and that ultimately created the the fragility in the system. So, you know, how I tend to look at it is, we had all the major players in the economy gear themselves to one common factor, which was economic stability. So corporations felt like, you know, the likelihood of them having any type of, of real disruption in their their cash flows is very low. And you know, if if and as the economy slowed down, the Fed had the appropriate tools, and because the banking sector was relatively healthy, there wouldn't be a real disruption to their ability to access credit, nor would there be a a real interruption to consumers' ability to access credit. And, and uh, you know, consequently, the economy should chug along reasonably well. And in that environment, you might as well just lever your balance sheet, which is what corporations did. They borrowed a lot of money and bought their stock back and became highly levered. And and investors did the same thing. Well, they didn't do the same thing. They they allowed corporations to do that. You know, the investors in a their hunt for yield were looking to uh, lend or engage in all kinds of activities to get higher returns than they probably otherwise would have been able to get. They engaged in riskier activity, you know, got involved in less liquid types of securities, and uh, and basically funded the corporations levering of their own balance sheet. And in as much we became 
less robust as a system and, and more fragile. But that that was not apparent, I, I would say, to most people. And so, you know, this crisis came along, and this is about the worst catalyst that you could hope for that type of structure because it robbed, it really robbed everyone of the revenue to to pay its debt. And you know, and, and that's exactly what we've accumulated over the last decade or so is just a, a ton of debt. And so, you know, something like this is just there. There would there would have been some type of catalyst inevitably. It just so happened that we got really unlucky, and this is the worst possible one, I would say. Eric, the response from governments around the world, particularly the U.S. government, has been to respond in many ways with bailout policies that involve creating a whole bunch of new debts. In some cases, those are debts that are forgiven if certain goals are achieved. So I guess those are more grants than debts. But in other cases, it's guaranteed loans in order to facilitate uh, bridge capital to keep the economy going and to keep businesses from failing. Doesn't that just create even more debt and uh, potentially set us up for an even worse fall further down the road? Yeah, that's a good question, Eric. I would say that, I guess, let's start and, and look at what the Fed did. And, and I think what they did actually was was vital. So if you if you take what I mentioned just a, you know, a few minutes ago about what got us here, we basically got ourselves into a position as a society where we were far more leveraged than we realized. And that leverage came through corporate balance sheets. It came through investor portfolios and the types of leverage that they had embedded into those portfolios. And let's forget about the, the government balance sheet for a minute. You know, consumers obviously have reasonable amounts of debt. Perhaps they're you know not as much as they have at various points in the past. Because you have a very leveraged economy. And all of a sudden, because of this catalyst, meaning the, the virus, people needed to gross down quickly. And so you had way too many people selling essentially everything, which is why you saw not only stocks fall, but you saw stocks fall, you saw bonds fall, you saw gold fall, everything fell all at the same time. And if the Fed had not come in and drawn a line underneath that with their with the policies that they implemented, we would have seen a crash that was far worse than what we've seen. You know, I think we had the, the U.S. equity market fall 35% from the highs or something like that, which is may sound dramatic, but it was only down 25% of the year. So I, I think just unambiguously, we would have been down at least 50 and perhaps 80% had the Fed not done what it did. And it essentially just looked at the overall structure and pretty quickly came to, the I think, the appropriate conclusion, which is that if everyone is over leveraged and they all need to gross their books down in one way or another at the same time. There literally is not a buyer. There's just no buyer. There's no strong hand out there. There's only one hand and that was the Fed. So so that's what they what they did. I and mean, we can argue about whether or not that's fair, or right? You know, I think I think they prevented a complete market collapse and that would have accentuated the economic collapse that we're in. So we're you know we're we're in a depression right now. The only the only question is how quickly we get out of it. And in a depression that has you know such a high economic and, and human toll, you know taking taking debt up to try to mitigate the the impact of that seems to be you know reasonable reasonable policy. You know the question is what does that lead to ultimately? And I think. You know, there are a lot of open questions about that, and a lot of those are dependent on what some of the next policies are. A lot of them are dependent on how you know CEOs act and and consumers, and you know those there there are a lot of there are a lot of questions. I mean, we could we could talk about a few different scenarios that come out of that, but um, there certainly are a lot of open questions about that right now. Eric, let's talk about managing portfolios and preparing them for events like this. Obviously, we hope that this pandemic will be a once in a hundred years event, but I don't think financial dislocations on this scale are anything close to a once in a hundred years event. I think they're going to get more and more frequent. So one of the most popular guests we've had on this year is Chris Cole from Artemis Capital, who's talked about the benefits of using long volatility and commodity trend following as components of a modernized portfolio, replacing the 60-40 portfolio 
adding those components in order to create much more resiliency in a crisis. Eric, your firm, One River Asset Management, runs both long volatility funds as well as trend-following funds. And I know for regulatory reasons, you're not at liberty to tell us about the performance of those funds. But frankly, uh, you know, you guys are famous now. It's it's in the, the news. You're up huge in your long vol fund. So talk to us a little bit strategically, because one of the things Chris Cole told us is there's lots of different ways to skin a cat when it comes to long vol strategies. How do you approach providing a risk hedge with your long vol funds. Obviously, it's worked extremely well for your investors to hedge losses in their other assets. How did that work out? How do the correlations work? And what's your approach to that strategy? Yeah, so we have a few. uh, So we have five strategies as a firm. So we have a a discretionary long volatility fund, which trades volatility across asset classes uh, on a global basis. And we, we look for what we think are the most attractively priced markets in which we can buy vol and uh, you know hopefully profit from from a rise in those levels. We run a systematic long equity vol strategy that's called dynamic convexity that focuses exclusively on on equity vol with an emphasis on on U.S. markets. And then we run a a volatility uh, relative value strategy, which is really a market neutral high alpha type strategy that's generate very you know, very high sharp over over its life, and, and it's you know truly market neutral. And we're just looking for dislocations globally, and uh, you know have done well doing that. Our trend strategies: we have one that's a classic trend that looks at sixty of the most liquid global markets across asset, and you know follows those trends. And then and then we have one that's focused on more esoteric markets, one hundred and four different global esoteric markets, um, which are you know pretty interesting to to try to capture trends on. You know, all of those strategies are are built with an eye toward mitigating risk, and I think that you know, having been in this industry for I don't know, thirty plus years at this point, I've learned through seeing so many dislocations and different strategies really struggle or, or blow up at times. That if you know if you don't embed really good risk mitigation into what you do, either on the strategy level like R five strategies or at the broader portfolio level, like a lot of investors, you know, sooner or later something happens and you suffer really substantial losses. And so we've had a particular focus on what we felt was you know, going to be a, a pretty material market turn as this cycle ended. And remember, this is the longest bull market in U.S. history and the longest economic expansion in U.S. history. And a lot of the behaviors that naturally come out of that certainly imply and, and now we've seen it really play out, but imply that the turn will be you know pretty dramatic. In terms of how our you know our strategies have been used and we we look at everything that we do as not really hedging but making money. We just think that we're at that stage in the cycle where we could make a lot of money being long ball. It did so happen that our investors use that for hedges in their portfolios. And the I'd say the, the you know the really interesting thing over the last few years and I think that this is going to be amplified now. But the really interesting thing is it's become increasingly difficult to build robust portfolios because interest rates are very low and the classic 60-40 portfolio or even the you know the, the leveraged version of that, it just when interest rates get really low, it makes it extremely difficult to build a robust portfolio because it's just harder and harder for your your bond portfolio to offset the losses embedded within your equity portfolio and what or you know whatever risks you have in your portfolio. And so, you know, we felt like, well, number one, trend following historically has done a good job of helping offset some of those risks and, you know, in, in big bear markets. But it's also a strategy that can make money in in big bull markets as well. It's following large trends. Uh, but long volatility in particular, we think is is a super interesting place because number one, vol, the levels of vol just got so low that they presented good value in terms of helping offset risk in your portfolio. But because so many people were short, it also is a place where you could say in a market stress environment, vol levels are probably going to go very, very high, maybe higher than they than they ever have in history. And uh, and so you know we really focused on on that opportunity and you know, thankfully had uh, had investors that invested alongside of us in that. 
When we've covered the long vol strategy in other interviews on Macro Voices, we've talked about breaking it into separate concepts, one of generally trading volatility. And and so you're you're looking at things like straddles, uh, you know, buying them when, when they're cheap and selling them when they're expensive versus something like a express tail hedging strategy where you're really specifically buying tail hedges in order to hedge against those unlikely outlier events. It sounds like primarily what you guys are doing, and I just want to verify this, is the former. You're you're trading volatility, not to plan for a specific outlier event, but just because it's not that hard to have a strategy that systematically trades volatility and is profitable and and can be profitable in a a way that's not only independent of other asset classes, but inversely correlated with them. Yeah, that's right. We focus on the former, so we're not specifically in the business of, uh, of, of tail hedging and it's not that there's anything specifically wrong with that. I think for some investors and in their portfolio constructions, that can make sense. But we felt that vol is at levels where you could make a lot of money on the upside without having to bet on a tail event. And uh, and oftentimes when you bet on a tail event, you may endure a market dislocation, but you, know, you don't really make money unless you get some kind of really wild tail. And so we're more interested in you know, looking at, at opportunities in you know in various straddles globally and in all kinds of markets and but having some direction risk as well. So that that's been our our approach on the discretionary uh, side. And and so what we really are doing is just we're hunting for the most convex ways that we can find in the global markets to make money in certain types of dislocations. And when you look at a crisis like this, I think that in my experience and studying history, they come, they tend to come in waves. So it tends to be the case that, you know, one area will be the epicenter of, of the first stage in the crisis. And in this case, it was equities and which is where we had our risk focus. And then they'll, they tend to spread out. And so we think that there will, will be, uh, there's likely to be, you know, very high foreign exchange volatility on a forward-looking basis, because that's one of the few areas where countries, you know, can have some type of uh, ballast to help their economy if they can't actually go out and borrow money and print money as aggressively as the U.S. and you know the Europeans and Japanese have done. So, you know, some of the countries that don't have the same level of flexibility in their domestic policies, I think. You know the the shock of of what's happening in in economies will be reflected in changing foreign exchange rates. So, so we think that you know that's an area that represents a lot of opportunity. And so, you know, a week and a half or so ago, we actually rotated out of most of our our equity vol, uh, thankfully, because those, those vaults have come down a long way. But rotated into into foreign exchange, and I think. After this wave, there will be there will be additional waves to this crisis, and I think, you know, a big one will come when we start seeing some of the political ramifications of of what's happening right now. We haven't really seen that yet, but that's you know, that's on its way. You don't get a dislocation of of this size in financial markets and then the real economy without having very material political repercussions in you know, within countries and then between countries. And so those are some of the things that we're thinking about how to preposition for right now. Eric, let's move on now to the subject of trend following. For any of our listeners who are not already familiar with the concept, I did a full hour-long interview with Niels Kastrup Larson introducing this strategy and what it's about. You'll find the link to that episode in your research roundup email. Look for Neil's picture down near the bottom of the page. And I I highly recommend that as an introduction to the strategy. But one of the things Neil's taught us in that interview is there's lots and lots of different strategies that are all kind of being lumped into one by the industry. You know, they call it commodity trend. Well, a lot of these trend following funds really are not at all focused on commodities. They're they're following trends using commodity futures contracts in many cases, but very frequently uh, it's interest rates or it's uh, currencies or stock index futures. So 
How do you guys think about trend following? Is it a commodity-specific strategy? Is it broader than that? Is it entirely computerized algorithms? Do you use any discretionary decisions at all? How, does it, how do you bake this, this whole concept of trend following in your firm? So our approach to trend, in fact, our approach to anything that we ever do in markets is to first ask the question, why do you get paid to do something? You know, why is the market paying you? Who's on the other side of your trade? And I think that's super important to to think about no matter what type of investment activity you engage in. Because, you know, in essence, you're you're trading against people who are who are not dummies. In the case of trend following, our approach is to trade medium to longer term trends. There may be people who, who have figured out how to make money in very short term trends. I just don't understand why someone would, would get paid a significant amount of money to try to follow short-term trends. But long-term trends is different because I think, you know, when I when I observe pretty much everything in the world, there are medium to longer term cycles, whether they're political cycles or economic cycles or monetary cycles or innovation cycles or weather cycles or you know just general market cycles. And so we we try to focus on medium to longer term trends because I, you know, kind of observe them throughout society and nature. And I think it's difficult for most people to hold on to trends and hold on to positions for a very long period of time. The biggest trends that that I've observed in my career essentially are reflecting some type of fundamental shift that's taking place in the world that people don't yet fully appreciate. That's why you have a long-term trend. And so in in periods of of a lot of change, it would make sense that you have, you know, that you have longer term trends that persist for quite some time. So those are the ones that that we focus on. Trends tends to work when you have a really diversified mix of of asset classes and instruments and expression globally, you know, just across markets. So one of our trend strategies is focused on the 60 most liquid markets across the, the four major asset classes. So currencies and equities and commodities and interest rates. And then our alternative markets trend is focused on 104 more esoteric markets globally that that are expressed in those same asset classes, but then also in, in credit indices. And so in our, our core trend, for instance, you might see a commodity like copper. And in our alternative markets trend, you might see something more esoteric like iron ore, for instance. And so at any rate, they're there are two different sets of markets that we focus on, but that's, you know, that's our approach. And I think one of the most interesting things to me about trend is that um, you know, we've built some very good strategies that have done well and beaten peers largely across the board in an environment where trend has not been a great performer over the past decade. In fact, if you look statistically, the last decade has been about the worst decade that you've seen in the last 120 years. And the question is, why is that the case? And I think, I think that it's probably the case that it maps to this period of uh, a lot of central bank intervention and extremely low levels of volatility, where you know that we had a lot of economic stability, we had policy stability, and as a consequence, not as many things really moving a whole lot. You know, we have been waiting for this inflection point in markets, and I think now that we have this inflection. And we start seeing some of the changes that I think will, you know, will will roll out over the coming decade. It wouldn't surprise me if uh, if trend is, you know, it goes from having had one of its worst decades of the past 120 years to one of, you know, one of its best. And so we think it's a nice addition to a portfolio, particularly in a world where, when you think about constructing a portfolio, there really there's very little that you can that a big investor can do to create balance in their portfolio and have some type of offsetting exposure to a bear market or a real dislocation. You know, interest rates won't do it anymore. Bond yields are so low right now that they, they can't help offset risk. And historically, trend strategies have done a very good job of, of helping mitigate risks in a broader portfolio in, you know, in times of disruption and, and then just make a lot of money in times of, you know, a really big trend. The 1970s is the best decade of the past 120 years for, uh, for trend. So, Hopefully that you know that's what we have to look forward to.
Well, I wanted to give you a chance to talk about those strategies because I know they've been the performers in this environment. You're up huge on the year in your long vol fund, and you're making money on the year on your trend fund, which is a lot better than most of the industry can say. But I want to talk now about where we're headed with the fallout from this crisis, because it seems to me that, uh, you know, obviously it's a really big deal. It's, uh, it's affected the whole world. But the monetary and fiscal policy bazooka shot that we've seen in reaction, I mean, it, it was first unlimited monetary intervention. The $2 trillion fiscal intervention was, I think, the biggest fiscal stimulus ever contemplated in the history of the United States. And that only lasted a day until they came up with another one of the same size uh, and doubled it. And, and who knows when they're going to double it again. So, Eric, it seems to me that regardless of what your opinion is on whether it was prudent to have this type of policy intervention, we've got it. And it seems to me like probably the long term impact is not going to be the coronavirus crisis, but it's going to be the results of this just totally unprecedented intervention. So what are those consequences and knock on effects going to be of suddenly having bigger monetary and bigger fiscal stimulus than we've ever seen before? There are a, a whole range of, of knock-on effects that I think lie in our future. And, uh, you know, a, a number of them are really dependent on some of the political choices that are made. And they're dependent on whether or not we can avoid material conflict, you know, over the, the coming years. And when I say that, I just mean that you know, there are, there's some really big open questions that I have, and I think that they're the right questions to be asking. You know, one, one of them is, okay, so we have just done one of the most kind of breathtaking monetary interventions in history, and at the same time, the largest fiscal intervention. And to your point, it's not over. Uh, we're not talking about a trillion dollar infrastructure spend as well. And uh, my guess is before this is over that we will have spent many, many more trillions of dollars than uh, you know than we've currently announced. That would be my guess. So the question is how to how do corporations and how do consumers respond? How do markets respond to that? The truth is we don't really know. There are a number of different directions that we could go in. I think you know one of the optimistic scenarios is that all of this intervention really does fill the hole that was left by this you know, massive decline in people's incomes and corporations' revenues. And that somehow, some way, we we push through this psychological disruption, you know, and, and kind of this stay-at-home crisis that we have right now. And the economy can restore balance, you know, reasonably quickly. And we just kind of carry on. I, you know, that's that's probably the the most optimistic scenario that that we could have here. I think somewhere in there needs to be a, a pre scalable treatment for COVID nineteen, you know, followed by a vaccine. And uh, you know, I think in in a lot of respects, the markets are kind of pricing that to a degree. I mean, we look at where equities are right now; they're really not down very far from the highs. They're certainly not down a whole lot from the start of the year. So they, you know, it it might feel like it's been a big disruption, but it, the equity market is, I think, really trying to look through this crisis. Some of the other possibilities, though, are that we, you know, we get ourselves into a into a spot where we just trudge through this, and uh, and consumers and corporate CEOs are so reluctant to spend money or make capital investments that we just get stuck in a, a bit of a depressionary type bunker mentality, and you know, by all the major economic actors here, and this this existing depression that we're in right now turns into something that's just more chronic. And while the policymakers feel that they, that their tools are sufficient to get us out, it's just, it's just much harder than expected to reverse that type of bunker mentality that, that people grind themselves into. And so that, you know, that's, that's a much more dangerous scenario. I think that's the type of scenario that could could lead society to start looking for all kinds of scapegoats and, you know, could lead to just darker scenarios. And we've seen what, what some of those are historically that happens when you have big economic disruptions. Sometimes you have very large political disruptions and you have uh, geopolitical disruptions. You know, within that, I would say inflation 
inflation becomes a consideration that we that we all need to think about. So in an environment where where the government throws a lot of money at the economy and people just save it, that's not a particularly inflationary type setup. And I think it's probably where we are right now, roughly speaking. But in in an environment where you throw a lot of money at the economy and things really start picking up quickly, there are inflationary risks there for sure. But you know the big inflations of the world, stripping out the 1970s, the the big inflations in the world are are really caused by a, a major decline in in supply combined with some type of monetary mischief by uh, you know by by countries, and that's that's something that could be pretty interesting. The question is, what's the big disruption in supply? And I would say that historically, wars you know, wars destroy supply, the ability to produce things. And and so you combine that with monetary mischief or printing and you get a lot of inflation. But in our case, you know, one of the possibilities is that this deglobalization destroys a lot of capacity just in that if we make a decision as a society that we we want to just essentially trash our international supply chains at all, you know, that's just a huge productive capacity that we've built up over the last 20 years. If we make the decision on the backside of this crisis that we need to build a lot more redundancy here in the U.S., then by definition, we have destroyed a lot of capital and productive capacity, and we need to rebuild it here. And so the economy that starts to get its legs back with a decision to, to have to rebuild productive capacity domestically, that could be that would be a very strong case for a really material inflation. And I think that would catch the market by surprise because people have just grown so accustomed to thinking there just will be no, no inflation. I couldn't agree with you more. And this is something that I've been musing on for 10 years now is I, I have no idea what the event was going to be that would eventually overcome this massive wave of, of deflationary backdrop and get us to inflation. But I've always said, you know, that's where the game changes, because once you've got secular inflation, all of a sudden, the, the printing press is not the solution to everything because the consequence of more quantitative easing is exacerbating the inflation that we didn't have in 2008. Eric, would you agree with me that the toolbox central bankers have to work with in terms of intervention gets uh, taken away or, or a lot of the tools get taken away if we move to a secular inflation environment? They don't get taken away per se, but they become much more difficult to use. And, you know, the scenario that that scenario becomes a very that, that becomes a very dangerous, vicious scenario economically. I absolutely agree with that. And look, it might even be less complex if those tools actually got taken away. The difficulty will be that the central banks have the tools that they have. They want to maintain economic growth, low employment, et cetera, et cetera. And if they discover that we start to see higher levels of inflation and they're trying to support economic growth and lower unemployment, you know, and, and yet the tools that they're using seem to be increasing inflation, but the removal of their policies or the reversal of their policies would at a minimum create much more unemployment and amplify the problems that they're, that they're trying to address. You know, that's where you really get into trouble because it's just a terrible choice for these guys to have to make, you know, and that will that would come, you know, against this political backdrop that I think is going to be a really challenging one. I mean, I, I, I think domestically and internationally, we we have a number of years ahead where we are going to be having to contemplate, you know, really stressed kind of political backdrops like we just have not we just none of us have seen in our in our, in our lifetime at least in the developed world and maybe in, in some of the emerging markets they've there have been the types of disruptions that you know that that we're about to have to face but um anyway probably moving off of your question too far but i i think that policymakers and you know central banks it's pretty likely over the next few years that they're going to have some of these very difficult choices to make. And they, they will have the tools to continue to stimulate, but that may amplify inflation. And, and that's where they get into a really difficult spot. 
Sounds like you're going to need an inflation fund in addition to your long vol and, uh, and trend following funds in order to, uh, to round up the toolbox for the, the coming environment. What else uh, is on the horizon? We've talked about inflation as a major theme of what might change as a result of this crisis. What are the other major implications uh, of either the coronavirus crisis or just the general economic environment that we're looking at right now? I think something that, that people perhaps don't don't appreciate enough is that the market or is the the overall environment for the dominance of equity investing has just been you know incredibly supportive for almost as long as most of us have you know have been in trading and investing and it appears to me that that is that is really drawing to a close meaning that the tax structure that we have the capital markets structure, the kind of investment cult mentality behind investing in equities, all of these things have have led people to to lean heavily on persistent and strong equity returns to meet their investment needs. And you know you need you need to look no further than the U.S. state and in many cases corporate pension plans that need you know seven seven and a half percent returns forever to avoid becoming insolvent. Now, you know, these these types of firms and funds are going to be looking at an environment where the government bond yield is close to zero. Certainly the Fed is going to muscle almost the entire curve as close to zero as possible and then kind of shrink mortgage spreads so that people can refi. But you know, the consequence is they can't they're not going to be able to earn material returns on their bond portfolio. And the question is, are equities going to be able to make up for it? And what I've described over the course of this discussion is an environment where everyone was you know, at peak leverage going into this. And the question is, are the policies coming out of it going to either one, just allow for resumption of that same level of leverage or even increase it, or will it decrease it? And I think that you can make a very strong argument that the policies that are going to be implemented in the aftermath, on the backside of this crisis, they are going to have the effect of decreasing leverage on the real economy. So, you know, corporate CEOs who have levered their balance sheet and levered their economy to very low levels of economic volatility and done everything possible to increase the value of, of their equities through buybacks, et cetera, et cetera, you know, work their way into very high margins, very high leverage. And I think you make the case that that's not going to be the case going forward that they're going to have to build more redundancy into their business models, into their capital structure. And so they'll, by definition, become more resilient, but but less profitable. So I think that that will happen. I also think that that investors simply can't, even if they wanted to take the same levels of risk, they can't do it because their risk models will show a lot more risk. With a government bond yield down close to zero, they don't have anything that they can scale, you know, trend they can scale to a degree, but not as big as buying tons of bonds. They don't have anything to scale that's going to allow them to take the same level of leverage. So in an environment where the corporate sector is running at less leverage and the investor community is operating their portfolios at less leverage, they're going to be, you know, big issues that that arise with just levels of returns that people need. And we're just not going to, it seems highly unlikely we're going to be able to achieve the types of returns that are required to make the pension system in the U.S. work, and that's going to create a lot of problems. But I think what it will also do is it will just cap the value of equities. I think we'll move to a much lower equity valuation plateau, and that's not to say that equities can never go up. They'll go up and they'll go down. But these these years of equities just going up all the time, I, I, I really think are over. And when you look around the world, the U.S. has really been the outlier. I mean, Japan, the Nikkei, the Nikkei is still where it was in the late 80s, if you just look back and uh, Euro stocks are where they were 20 years ago, you know, they haven't moved. They've gone up and down, but they haven't moved. And the U.S. has really been the only market that's that's really moved. And, there, you know, there have been a couple other markets. But in terms of the really big major markets, the U.S. has been a huge outlier. And I strongly suspect that that, that period is, you know, it's in the process of ending. So, you know, policies will be much more friendly toward labor, much less friendly toward capital. And that will impact the financial markets in a really profound way.
Well, Eric, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview this week. Before I let you go, please give us a quick overview of what you do at One River Asset Management. So we run five funds. We run a discretionary long volatility fund. We run dynamic convexity, which is a systematic long equity volatility strategy. We run a market neutral volatility RV strategy. And then the opportunity set for that is just going to be wonderful going forward. And then we run two systematic trend strategies, one focused on the the most uh, liquid 60 global markets across asset class and one on more esoteric markets. And um, we work with very large institutional investors all over the world. And uh, I think our our strategies are are really, they're really well built for the environment that I, I think is beginning to unfold on the backside of this crisis. And of course, for regulatory compliance reasons, I'm not allowed to ask you about the performance of your funds, but the trade press is doing it for you. So congratulations, Eric. Uh, You guys are up huge this year, and there's very few people who can say that. We're going to leave it there, folks. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. Macro Voices is a listener-driven program. Please email requests for specific future interview guests to requests at macrovoices.com. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com, and we'll answer them on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. We also welcome your suggestions for how we can improve the program. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was great to have Eric Peters back onto the show. You know, whenever we're talking about these managers that were long volatility into this crash, I can name even three or four of them that just uh, did great jobs hedging this downside risk. And it was really great to hear his insights on how things are developing. What did you take away from the interview? The thing that stood out for me, Patrick, was the discussion about inflation. And it's something that I've said for years is I don't know when we get a return to secular inflation. Uh, I'm not smart enough to know that. It's beyond my pay grade. What I do know is I think that's where the game changes, where suddenly central bankers can't solve every problem with printed money. And all of a sudden, the rubber hits the road, so to speak. I've noticed a pattern, Patrick, a lot of the smartest people that we have on the show recently, whether it's Eric Peters in this interview, Pippa Malmgren earlier this week, uh, several other feature interview guests are starting to talk about not just a little whiff of inflation, but a shift back towards secular inflation and the possibility that the COVID-19 crisis and the resulting government stimulus, which is just beyond belief, is what takes us there and gets us out of this deflation that we've been in for more than a decade now and into a new round of secular inflation. So I want to continue asking our expert guests about that topic. I think it's going to be incredibly important to follow. But for now, Patrick, we've got another of your famous post-game chart books. Listeners, you'll find the download link in your research roundup email. Now, if you don't have a research roundup email, that means that you haven't yet registered for a free account at macrovoices.com. No problem. Just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com. Look for the red button that says looking for the downloads right next to Eric Peter's picture. Patrick, diving into the post-game chart book on page two, we've got the S&P trajectory. I think you and Kevin Muir, we were down at what, like 20 250, 2300, when you guys said it's time for a bear market rally to take us back to 2800. So congratulations on the call. We're there. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, well, I mean, the, the chart here is just uh, the analog of, of uh, what would it look like if we did 2008, 2009. It wasn't necessarily a forecast, but that was certainly the way we were positioning in the market. Like, it, we were just so oversold. A reflexive rally is just par for the course for the way the market naturally behaves. But uh, for the first time since the market top, this is a very, uh, this level on the stock market is uh, high interest to me because it's starting to get asymmetric. 
metric to explore the downside, especially as volatility is contracting and, and those uh, crazy vol premiums that we were seeing in the 60, 70, 80 percent ranges have, uh, have backed off quite a bit. Anyway, uh, just to, all I wanted to keep doing on this chart was just keep showing members uh, an analog of, uh, of 2008-9 and see whether or not this compares or will work out similar to the post-Lehman period. Not necessarily a forecast, but it'll be interesting to see how uh, it plays out. One thing I do think is, though, that uh, the market is still likely to go lower. I think a lot. Uh, what usually happens during bear market rallies is the rally lasts long enough to convince everyone it's real. And only when everyone starts talking like, you know, it's going to keep going up and I missed it and all these different things, usually that's from a sentiment perspective when you can really realize that it's run its course. And that's uh, certainly something we're going to continue to watch. What do you think about my theory that next week-ish, maybe end of next week, possibly into the following week, we get a reduction in the number of new COVID-19 infections and that I think is potentially the trigger for the last blow off top before reality sets in. Uh, how does that jibe with what you're predicting here? That certainly is possible. The The one thing that almost always happens is that there has to be huge volatility, both higher and lower, to whipsaw, to drive uh, and knock out stop losses in the weak hands. This is not going to be an easy top to catch on this. So there, I, I think that there's a number of fake outs. Maybe we'll see it next week start with a big sell. And then suddenly what we'll do is uh, there'll be a huge jump maybe towards 2,900 just to wipe everyone out that went short. And then it'll roll. So I in the market, has a tendency to um, to make it very difficult to catch this turn. So I think maximum volatility is, a, is what we should expect. Moving on to page three, my favorite topic, crude oil. What do we got here? Well, I just wanted to show the chart. I mean, overall, for the fact that we were talking this big production cut and all of these different things uh, like Trump's tweets, oil is not far from its uh, key lows, right? Like it, it, I'm, I'm actually just reflecting and taking a step back and looking at this chart and crude looks incredibly distributed. Uh, it's it's a very weak looking chart. And so it's it's just not not impressive to me at all. This chart shows that we're uh, heading right back down to the base, almost near the lows, right? Exactly, Patrick. And the thing is, this is just the flat price chart, the front month price of crude oil. And this is where it gets deceptive. We've had so many listeners that have uh, said on Twitter or in emails that they've sent us, you know, how can I possibly go wrong? It's going to hit 20 bucks again. Uh, if I buy that low, if I buy oil for 20 bucks, okay, even if it goes to 10, I can ride it out, and, and I know it's going to go back to 50 bucks someday. The problem is there is nothing that's just called oil that you can buy with a symbol and get that $20 price and sell it when it's 50 Now, we covered this a couple of weeks ago, but we got quite a bit of confusion, I think, and questions on Twitter and so forth. So I want to move on to page four, which is showing the crude oil term structure. That little dot at the bottom there, that is the May 2020 delivery contract, and that's expiring next week. The next dot above it is June, and then July, then August, then September, and October, and so forth. Now, if you go about six or eight months out, you see how the dots are all close together. Normally, if you're that guy who said, I, I, I bought 20 bucks because it just seemed like a great deal. If you bought one of those dots that's further out on the curve and you had to roll it forward to the next month's price, which you have to do at the end of each month. Well, gee, you know, those dots are just really close together. What's the difference there? It's like 20 cents or something. You know, I, I, I can just eat that as a little bit of a, a friction cost, cost of trading. Forget about it. What happens is it's not too important to the speculator who's long crude oil that there's that little bit of roll premium that it's called every month until you get a situation where storage is an extremely high demand. In this case, it's because we've got too much oil and no place to store it. And then what happens to the term structure is this shape you see here, which we call super contango, huge amount of vertical space between those dots. The easiest way to explain why this happens and how it happens is to think about it from the perspective of the different traders in the marketplace. The guy who bought the May contract for 20 bucks because it just seemed like such a bargain, 
really was just thinking about, you know, having crude oil for the next umpteen couple of years or something and selling it later. When he goes to roll that contract at the end of the month, normally the person on the other side of that might be one of the commercials. Those are people who have great big tanks full of oil. So they're long physical crude oil and they're short futures contracts. So when you want to sell your May contract and buy a June contract, the guy who is buying your May contract and selling you the June contract is usually somebody who owns physical oil in one of these storage tanks. Under normal circumstances, that guy with the tank is saying, okay, that profit of 20 cents or so, well, you know, that's about all I can get if I, if I were to deliver my oil into the market. Instead of rolling my futures contract forward, if I were just to deliver the oil that I have that I'm short into the market, uh, my tank would be empty and I might not be able to find anything to do with it. Well, in this environment right now, Patrick, if you control a physical oil storage tank, the mafia is probably talking to you because they want to have a conversation with you about your tank. So these guys know that they're in a position of power. And what they say is, you know what? So you, you, Mr. Mr. Retail Trader, you've got to roll your May contract into the June contract, which normally costs a premium of about 20 cents. Uh, this month, right now, as we're recording, Patrick, let me just look. It's $5.99 for the May to June contract. That's $6. So you're losing almost one third of the value of your investment just in the one month roll forward. Well, if you're the investor, you say, hey, buddy, you're, you're trying to take advantage of me. I'm not going to do that. Here's the thing, Patrick. You have to close your May futures contract by the end of next week, or you have to accept physical delivery of 1,000 barrels of crude oil. Those are your only choices. The retail trader doesn't have a tank to put that oil in. He has to do it. Now, the other guy the commercial, he's got the oil in a tank and he has the option to deliver it into the market. So the retail guy says, I, I won't do it. That's that's too much. Six dollars just to roll my position for one month. That's crazy. The guy on the other side says, yeah, it's really crazy. And it's going to be six fifty in in the next hour if you don't act right now, because the closer that we get to expiration, when there's just no storage available, the guy that owns the tank basically owns the gold. So what happens is in one month, you're readjusting your basis from $25 to $31. You're giving up almost one third of the value of your investment in that roll premium. And that's the reason that it's possible to buy oil for $20 and then go to sell it when oil is at $40 and still lose money on the trade because you lost money on those contango rules. And what we can expect is for this super contango structure to continue for the next several months because of the shortage of storage capacity. Now, this creates tremendous trading opportunities, Patrick. If you take a look at, let's go, well, one, two, three, four dots from the bottom up on this chart on page four. Let's suppose that you were to short a one month futures time spread. In other words, you might say if that's May at the bottom, June is the next one, July is the next one. Let's say you're going to sell August and buy September. Well, they're only what? It looks like uh, at this moment, they're about 40 cents apart. So you're shorting it for an entry price of 40 cents. You wait a couple of months until that thing's about to expire. And if the same storage conditions still exist then, which exist today, that spread might have blown out, as has happened on the May-June spread, to $6. And there's a huge profit there. So this contango expansion trade can be very profitable. Now, of course, eventually when the storage crisis goes away, when the economy is restarted and everything's back to normal, that contango is very quickly going to come out of the market and the trade can reverse on you in a moment's notice. So you've got to stay on top of the headlines and make sure you know what's going on in the world. But from a futures trading standpoint, this can be a very effective trade. Now, the, the thing we've gotten a lot of listener interest in is they're saying, look, Eric, you got to be able to trade future spreads. That's kind of professional trader stuff. It's really not within the reach of the average retail trader. Is there a way for retail guys to get involved in this same basic trade and not by doing the future spread, but instead by buying 
shares in the companies that own the tanker ships, which are being used to store oil in addition to the on-land storage. Now, that's another way of thinking about this trade. I personally am a futures trader. The way I put this trade on is with futures spreads. Patrick, I know that you've looked at the tanker trade, and I think you, you and your members are actually in that trade. Tell us a little bit about the stock traders' approach to trading this same basic concept here and how it plays out. Right. And so first of all, I want to do a shout out for uh, Harris Cooperman and other uh, hedge fund managers like that, that have been all over this uh, shipping story. Because really, uh, I didn't originate the idea, but it is just a great way of expressing this trade. So on page six, what we have is uh, the crude tanker rates, which are showing the uh, the daily charter rates for, for these ships that, uh, that store the crude. And they're north of 200,000 a day. Just to put it in context, last year, the average rate was about $40,000 a day for the crude uh, tanker at spot rates. And so these these tankers, uh, what they're essentially a lot of traders like the ones you're describing are literally doing is is buying spot, loading it up on these ships, going selling forward into the futures market, locking in much higher prices, and then just paying the, the uh, charter rates to actually just have this as floating storage. And what's interesting is, is that Morgan Stanley did a an interesting interview with a, a number of the CEOs of these tanker companies. And we linked uh, an actual article from Oil and Gas Journal that actually was on it, that conference call and detailed it. But it was just talking about that these companies, because they were really dealing in the spot market, going into this uh, entire period, as much as anywhere, some of them CEOs were saying 87% to 95% of their vessels are available now to be booked into these um, at these higher charter rates. And so long as uh, there's a, a lack of land storage, these ships are going to start being used as floating storage and actually reduce the fleet available and cause these charter rates to continue to skyrocket as, uh, as there's a, a no-brainer for a lot of these companies to just buy the spot, pay that charter rate, and in the end, deliver at a much higher price in the future. Patrick, let's just explain why these tanker ships come into the equation and what they have to do with oil storage. Let's go back to page four again, listeners. Look at that bottom yellow dot on $25. That's the May delivery contract for WTI crude oil. Now, look at not the next dot up, but two dots up. That's the August contract. That's at about $33. So there's a, at least $8 of difference. That's called the calendar spread or time spread just for those two months. Well, wouldn't it be cool without taking any speculative risk at all, if you could just say, hey, wait a minute, why don't I buy the May contract today? And I'll sell the August contract today. So I lock in a price of about $9. And if you move on to the next page on page five, we actually show what that May to August spread looks like. And since this chart was printed, it's actually moved higher. It's uh, $10 right now as we're recording on Thursday afternoon. Well, the idea is you buy the May contract the thing is, if you just had a place to put that oil in your back pocket and store it someplace for a couple of months, you could then deliver into the August contract. And that difference called the contango of $10 per barrel, instead of losing that to those guys that take advantage of you on the roll, you could keep that profit. In fact, you could lock in that profit without even having to know what the future price of oil is going to be because you can use today's prices to lock in both the purchase and the May contract and the delivery on the August contract. And you can lock in both prices right now today and get a $10 differential. The thing is, you got to have some place to put the oil and all of the storage tanks on land are completely booked. So the idea is you lease a ship, which is normally used to deliver oil from one continent to the other, and you're just using it as a floating gas tank. You fill it up with crude oil, tell the captain to go anchor for a couple of months and bring it back when we get to the delivery dates for that August contract. And oftentimes what you'll do is you'll just end up calling the captain back and saying, hey, Cap, stay at anchor. We just rolled that spread forward because the August to September and September to October spreads had widened out. We were able to roll that position for August delivery into October. So just stay on the anchor there. We'll call you when we need you. 
If you have the sophistication to rent out a tanker ship, you can make a fortune. And the thing is, Patrick, it's not speculation. You can lock in that profit by chartering that that tanker ship and you know how much you're going to make you're, you're not speculating as to what the price of oil is going to be in august you're using today's price for delivery in august so that's how the trade works but you got to have a ship that can store crude oil in order to do it so i just wanted to explain that please continue with the story well, that's the whole point. And so the charter rates for these ships are actually, uh, you know, susceptible to price discovery. And so the wider the spread is, the more profit there is. And the more profit there is, the more they can bid up the ships to lock them in so that they can actually make this trade. And so these uh, these ships have been, uh, some of them in the last couple of weeks have been going for $200,000 plus a day. And so it was interesting, if one has a speculation that this contango is not going away for months and it's going to stay. Then, then these shipping companies are literally printing money. And it was interesting is that in that conference call on Morgan Stanley, uh, the Euronav CEO, Hugo Descoop, basically uh, said that they have the potential to generate profit greater than the company's market cap this year if these rates persist throughout the year. So essentially, you have a scenario where these, if, if one is making a call that the, the contango is going to stay in there and these, these charter rates will stay there, these companies are completely mispriced for the amount of profit that they're about to print. Now, it's still a speculation, but if, it, if any now of Now, you're the, saying that's profit. So the earnings per share, the EPS, is the same as the share price. Yes. <laughs> that's not insane. Now, now obviously this that's a speculation that those charter rates will stay there the rest of the year. Obviously if they if the contango disappears and the charter rates uh, in a couple of months go back to 20,000 a day, then they had a nice profit boost, but the idea of how much profit they can make, they would have to sustain for the whole year for that number to be cracked. Now, my question Patrick is, you know, everybody, not everybody, but a lot of smart people know about this already. It seems like these charter rates that we're looking at were way up just in the last few days because of this OPEC cut nonsense. And again, listen to the interview with Art Berman if you want to understand why this cut really doesn't have as much relevance as the media would like to suggest that it does. There was a, a dip there, but it was very short-lived. We're back up to those high rates. So at this point, is the share price pretty much already, you know, baking in the, the value that's there? Or is there still an opportunity to make money by buying these shares? Well, there, there's a lot of smart people out there putting some heavy money at this thinking that uh, it's not priced in. But really, what the most immediate reaction over the last week has everything to do with the fact that uh, supply cuts have a negative impact on the tanker market. So when that big headline from Trump came out, the first impulse is to hit the tankers the moment uh, there's an idea that there's going to be a production cut. And so this is why the speculation really is on how much you really believe that OPEC is going to stick with this and that that, that oversupply isn't going to be there. So long as there's going to be a huge amount of oversupply of oil and the lack of demand, these ships are going to get filled up pretty quick. And so this is a, this is a great way of playing the contango in the market. Patrick, let's move on to the gold chart on page seven here. You've got the price from earlier in the day here at 1746. That was pretty close to the, the high of the day. It did close a little bit lower than that, right around where that head and shoulders uh, neckline would be at uh, around 1730 or so. It looks to me like this chart's looking awful bullish. And uh, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking 1922, which was the 2011 low, is not that far away. Yeah. On the short term, the, the path of least resistance for gold remains heading upwards to 1800 or so, even higher. Like we could go back to fully retest the 2011 highs. I do think that this will be still very volatile, though. If we uh, enter another period where the stock market goes into a liquidity event, it's going to be hard pressed for gold to kind of decouple from that uh, that broader noise that's going to come in the whole entire marketplace. So uh, on the short term, I continue to think that gold is going to edge higher, but I, I don't think it's a free ride to just stay long. So we'll, we'll have to definitely see how it continues to develop. Patrick, moving on to page eight. I had to catch myself today because I thought that I had drifted off asleep at my trading desk and I was having a dream because it's only when you have dreams that crazy things happen, like public officials that are supposed to be grownups decide that what the Fed, the Treasury, the Central Bank of the United States ought to do is buy junk quality credit in order to support the junk 
bond market. Now, when Michael Milken was playing crazy games in the junk bond market in the 80s, he went to jail and he was a sinister bad guy. I think he was even one of the characters that they based the, the bad guy on the Wall Street movies about. Now we've got Jay Powell doing it and nobody's arresting him. What the heck is going on here? Let's start with the story on what's happening with the Fed and junk bonds and then move into this chart. Well, you, you know, I just really wanted to point out the the credit spread, like because what ended up happening was uh, the junk bonds just blew out. Like, I mean, you had an eight hundred plus basis point spread over Treasuries, and the moment the first wave of QE came in, and they they tackled the uh, investment grade quality and government bonds, the the spread just blew out even worse because they they weren't touching the the junk bond market. But what I think is happening is the Fed is realizing that they need to stabilize the entire or credit market in order to prevent this from avalanching down the side of the cliff. And so they, uh, they came in and uh, they're buying high yield. And it, obviously, we're, we're already two, 300 basis points off of the, the highs. But what is interesting to point out is the credit markets had such a, a drastic event that the only time we've seen credit spreads blow higher than this was 2008. And it's, I just think it's really, you know, it's, you can step back and reflect on on how this is developed. Now, obviously, with the Fed creating now an artificial market because they're going to be a buyer keeping yield suppressed, it's it's going to be really interesting whether or not, you know, credit risk has is, is really been tamed or, or not. And that's something that I think we're going to have to watch in the coming months. Maybe we should bring a high yield guest on just to really kind of size up what this means to the market because this is this is unprecedented. I don't think I've, I wouldn't have ever thought, well, I mean, there are certainly people that would have speculated that we'd be here, but it is here. And it's, it's amazing that we are, and I'm not sure how to interpret it. You know, Patrick, I still have some old leftover accounts receivable invoices for delinquent receivables from a business that I owned in the 1980s. I wonder if I can sell that to the Fed for 300% of original principal. I, I mean, it's just it's, what part of the word junk doesn't register for these people that they're spending public money to buy junk bonds? It absolutely amazes me that, that this is actually happening. I think that this uh, coronavirus response, in my opinion, folks, is much worse than the virus itself. On a happy note, though, let's move on. You're doing a live trading session with our friend George Gammon. For uh, listeners who went to our Macro Voices live event in Vancouver, George was the principal organizer behind that event, did all the legwork in order to make that possible, negotiating with the hotels for us. A live trading session online with you. What's it about and how can people join in? Well, I'm just doing it for all my paying members, but uh, also George has uh, promoted it on his end. But George wanted to learn more about options. So I said, well, why don't we just hold a, a live trading event where it's me and you and we're going to go through a boot camp and, and educate all of uh, uh, our members just on all the amazing things you could do with options. We have we put a real focus on gold on it. And we're, so we're going to spend a lot of time talking about, you know, collaring and how to how to create synthetics in the gold market and to leverage this uh, beautiful uptrend. And of course, you get what you pay for. So that one is only for paid members of Big Picture Trading. You can find the information and in signing up right here on the slide on page 10. All right, Eric, let's go on to the COVID-19. Uh, what's going on here? And give us an update as to how things have developed since you gave the last update. Patrick, there's so much to cover. Let's start with the general market narrative. As I said, when we did equities in the market wrap, I think that the White House has done a pretty good job of messaging to set expectations with the public that we're approaching peak new infections in the United States sometime in the next week, maybe 10 days. And the way it's being portrayed is, okay, that's the worst of the crisis. So, okay, finally, we're almost through this, this awful experience, and soon we'll be able to get back to work, according to President Trump. I think the market is already anticipating that event. They think it's only a week away. The rally has already started because the crisis is ending. There's a few inconvenient truths uh, associated with this, Patrick. I, I don't think the crisis is ending. Even if the pandemic were ending, the economic damage is really just starting. You can't reboot all of these failed businesses. A whole bunch of businesses have gone out of business. Employees have been laid off or fired. There's lost jobs. That stuff doesn't get turned back on when you start the economy. 
frankly, the United States has done a terrible job with the non-pharmaceutical interventions, containment mitigation strategies, and so forth. Initially, you know, one of the most important things is to get testing in place very early on and do it on a widespread basis. Initially, the CDC was blocking independent laboratories and prohibiting them from getting involved in testing. When it became clear the CDC was not going to get its act together, it seems like the president intervened and insisted that independent labs be allowed to contribute. You know, if you look at how China handled this, you never during that crisis saw Xi Jinping in public without a face mask on. That's called leadership by example. Trump doesn't just not wear the face mask, but he emphasizes in his press briefings that he doesn't think it's necessary and he refuses to wear it himself. So that's not leadership by example. That's bad example. The reopening beaches in Georgia, I heard, when we still are not yet at the peak level of infections and contagion, we're doing a lot of really dumb things, quite frankly. And there's a lot of people that are not taking the precautions seriously. I feel sometimes like the CDC is watching Chris Martinson's videos on a two-month lag. They just figured out that asymptomatic transmission is a really big thing and that we need face masks because of it. Well, Martinson was talking about that in January. Martinson first introduced hydroxychloroquine in the research around hydroxychloroquine and Zithromax in early February. You know, the, there's just so many things that have come up that the, the government's way behind on. So I don't think that the assumption that if we just take other countries' experience and project how many days we think it should be to the peak based on the experience of other countries, we've done a lot of things not as well as other countries. We haven't really implemented the social distancing measures as effectively as other countries, particularly in Asia. So I don't think we should expect to have the same results as someplace like Singapore or South Korea. So the first point, Patrick, is I'm not persuaded that that peak number of infections is necessarily assured to happen in the next 10 days. Good chance it'll happen then. Seems like that's what the models seem to say. But I just think there's reason to be suspect that it doesn't necessarily have to go that way. There's several other reasons, though, that the crisis is probably not ending. First of all, once you get to peak infections, That's just peak infections. There's at least a 17-day lag until you would get to the peak in deaths. And the amount of time when people are still contagious after initial infection can be up to 14 days. So from the peak infection date, you can't even think about reopening the economy for at least 14 days after that. But even, you know, 14 days after that, you've still got people that may not have been at the peak, but were just after the peak. They're still contagious. We can't reopen the economy. You look at Italy just extending ended the closure of their economy. Their their lockdown has been extended to May 3rd, and they were considerably ahead of us in terms of the timing of everything. There is also the possibility that you get something very common in epidemiology, which is it feels like you're getting a reduction in the number of infections, but then there's a final wave of infections and the numbers go back up again. Well, we haven't even had the numbers come down for more than one day before going back up again. But when that does happen, it doesn't mean that there can't be another wave. The other thing is the Spanish flu came in three major waves several months apart. It looks like China is having its second wave right now, and maybe also Singapore. So it seems like there's a good chance that there are multiple waves coming, and particularly it it seems like it's at least a year until we have widespread availability of a vaccine. Unless we can get to full herd immunity, which seems unlikely, there's probably going to be several more waves to come. And everything that we've seen so far seems to not confirm the idea that temperature and humidity would kill the the virus off. A lot of coronaviruses, unlike the influenza virus, uh, are not killed off just because there's warm weather. Now, Dr. Fauci did say that maybe we'll have only 60,000 instead of 200,000 deaths, but that's the deaths in the first wave. And it sounds, frankly, optimistic to me. I think that President Trump is going to rush to reopen the economy. It's very, very clear from his press briefings that he's very focused on that. 
Well, it's called the dance for a reason. The whole idea of that hammer and dance article, which I really recommend our listeners read if you haven't already, is after the hammer, the big containment, which is the, the lockdown, it's a dance. It's, it's, it's a, a nuanced, careful process to see how you slowly start to open things up without allowing the reproductive number to creep above one again. President Trump's not talking about doing a dance. He's talking about a wholesale restart of the entire economy, which doesn't sound very prudent. Now, look, that's what China tried to do. Now they're into their second wave. South Korea looks like it's having a second wave. As I said, Italy just extended their lockdown. Bill Gates suggested this week that there should be no mass gatherings, no football games or any of that until we have a vaccine, which could mean no sports uh, events and so forth for a full year or longer. There's troubling new data that came out this week, Patrick. Chris Martinson has a video. It's called Wait, You Can Get Reinfected. I recommend you check that out on his Peak Prosperity YouTube channel. But there's a couple of things that have been discovered. One is it's they call it NAB deficiency. NAB is is uh, medical slang, I guess, for neutralizing antibodies. That's the stuff you get in your blood after you've had the virus that fights it off the next time. Well, what they're finding is that with this particular SARS-CoV-2 virus, some people, about 5% of the study group, didn't ever develop any antibodies. They had it, they recovered, but they didn't get any antibodies, which means that they're not any less likely to get it again. And furthermore, that could mean, and this is, you know, this is new research. It hasn't been peer reviewed yet. It's not conclusive. We're dealing with information which is not completely decided yet. But the initial indications are that that would probably mean that vaccines would not work on those people because the way the vaccine works is it's introducing what's basically a dead virus into your bloodstream so that your body can produce the antibodies for it. Well, if your body is not producing antibodies for the real virus, it's not going to produce antibodies for the the dead virus. So if there's 5% of the population that basically the, the vaccine doesn't work on, that's a really big deal. There's also this question about reinfection. Now, there was a study out of China in mid-February saying that the second reinfection, so you get it, you recover, then you're exposed to it again, and you get it a second time, that most viruses, you know, you don't get it the second time because you have immunity. Uh, They're saying that you can get this one the second time and that it could be a much worse infection the second time around than the first one. Now, that study came out in mid-February. It was later criticized, and a lot of doctors thought, well, I don't think it's really a reinfection. It's more likely a latent infection, meaning you get it, and it becomes dormant in your body, and uh, it comes back, and you have a second event where you have symptoms for a second time. But it's not that you recontracted the virus again. It's that you had it the whole time, and you went through two waves of symptoms. Now, that opens the possibility, and again, this is not conclusive, it's not peer-reviewed yet, insert all your disclaimers here, it's an outlier case, but it could be that we're about to learn that this virus works like HIV or herpes, meaning once you get it, you've got it for life, you can't get rid of it, and you have recurring outbreaks that occur every so often where you experience the symptoms. We don't know that, that that is completely speculative, but they think that that's one of the possibilities. So my point is, there's a lot of reason to question, is there a second wave and a third wave? Do we really get to the point where we can fully reopen the economy until after we have a vaccine? Once we do have a vaccine, what if 5% of the population, the vaccine doesn't work on them because of this NAB deficiency issue? Um, These are all reasons that it doesn't make sense to equate we think the peak of new infections is coming next week to that means the economy is going to be fully back to normal next month. Uh, I think that we could have a number of partial shutdown of the economy effects that last for years potentially until we get to a full vaccine or full herd immunity. New York City's peak is what's expected in the next seven to 10 days. Well, that's not the national peak. Think about how things went down in China. 
big, big deal in Wuhan. They were finally starting to get it under control. And then they had outbreaks in all these other cities. And that's when they had to go to lockdowns all across the country. What if New York City was just the first really bad cluster? And we're about to have Chicago and Detroit and San Francisco and and a bunch of other places take off into New York City-like events. That's not certain to happen, but it is possible. I don't think markets are discounting any of these possibilities. Everybody seems to be focused on, okay, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. This thing's almost over. And I don't think that's the right way to think about it. Antibody testing is super duper important. And the reason is we just plain don't know how many people have had this thing and we don't know how close to herd immunity we are. If you can't depend on a vaccine anytime in the immediate future, if you could get to herd immunity where at least 80% of the population has had a mild case of it and has started to develop natural antibodies, then you get to where there's resilience and it's okay to start to open the, the economy back up. The thing is, you don't know that until you test for it. Antibody testing is not to see if you're sick with the virus. It's to test whether in the past tense you already had it. So if you, a whole bunch of people, myself included, have been sick in the last several weeks. Did I have a mild COVID infection, which means I, I've had my, my light version of this. I, I've developed antibodies, and that means that I'm not likely to ever have it again. Or does it just mean that I had a common cold and I'm just as susceptible as anyone else? The antibody test is what tells you that. In order for it to be effective, you have to use what's called surveillance testing. In other words, you can't just give it to people who want it and say, well, you've got symptoms, you're suspicious, you, you think you might have it, because then there's a selection bias where only people who probably do have it take the test. You have to administer this kind of surveillance testing to everyone in society equally, asking people to take it, which means it has to be super easy to administer. So it just takes a couple of minutes and you can ask everybody to do it to find out whether or not they already have antibodies for this virus. So my roadmap for where the market is likely to take us is I think the rally in the stock market continues for the next week to 10 days until we get to the point where we reach that peak of infections and the daily infection count that's being reported is coming down. Then I think there's a major upside acceleration for a couple of days until you get to a blow off top. And I think that's your sell the news event, because eventually we're going to figure out that was just peak infections. The crisis is still in full swing. If we make the mistake of trying to reopen the economy, which I think President Trump is prone to doing, I think it's going to result in a whole bunch of new clusters, more New York City sized events in other major cities all around the country. So uh, I think that rushing to reopen the economy could bring on a huge second wave. And you're already seeing economic impacts that are irreversible, Patrick. JP Morgan has halted all non-government guaranteed loans to small businesses. So all of a sudden, small businesses can't borrow money in credit markets. Those kinds of things are, are creating just all kinds of havoc in the economy. And just allowing people to, to go outside of their homes again is not going to get those businesses back online. Even when you do reopen, I think the recession is entrenched. Uh, I think there's going to be payback for these mask wars where the United States has been accused by everyone from Germany to Italy to Canada of hoarding all of the N95 masks and not sharing them with other countries. That's going to lead to some foreign policy tensions, both with China and with others. And I think there's knock-on effects that uh, all of this stuff, the knock-on effects are really going to kick in. And we've got a, a long, hard, challenging road to plow ahead of us. So I don't think it's anywhere close to over. And I think we're about to go through a false sense of it being over in the next two weeks. This episode was made possible by TopTradersUnplugged.com. Remember to get the ultimate guide to the best investing books ever written at TopTradersUnplugged.com forward slash macro guide. For information on sponsoring Macro Voices, please visit MacroVoices.com forward slash sponsor info.
Listeners, be sure to register a free account at MacroVoices.com. The benefit to you is you'll receive our Research Roundup email, which provides you with all of the best free content that we could find on the Internet each week, including downloads associated with our guest appearances, as well as, of course, our post-game chart books. Patrick, tell them what they missed in this week's Research Roundup. This week, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as a link to the charts we just discussed in this post game. You'll also find a link to the article we referenced in the post game from the Oil and Gas Journal about the tanker rates reaching record levels, as well as a link to a great interview with one of our favorite guests, Russell Napier, about how much debt is too much. And so you'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. That does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners, and we're always looking for suggestions on on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MBRR hashtag on Twitter and we'll include it in our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at Macro Voices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend and myself at Patrick Ceresna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening, and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at MacroVoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com, and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.